Okay, so hi all. I'm again really, really sorry about the confusion with the, with the links. This was my fault. And today we are very honored to host Professor Yerker Denrel of Warwick University. One of the many contributions of Professor Denrel to basic research include the clarification of the importance of the hot stove effect. I think kind of one example you saw uh, now, uh, although maybe it's not an exact example of the hot stove effect. Uh, so uh, Yerker, uh, we will speak today about the hot stove effect. And the floor is yours. You have about 45 minutes for the presentation before the questions. Do you want questions during the presentation or only after? I'm open for anything. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, if it's long discussions, then maybe we can take a little bit later, so. Okay, thank you. So great uh, being here. And um, uh, so this is a bit, a bit of, of um, summary of these things, but then also some discussion of some uh, important extensions. Okay. I should say perhaps as, at first that uh, I am not a psychologist and I wasn't trained as a psychologist and I'm not sure that I currently am a psychologist. I guess it depends how you define it. So um, I'm mainly interested in these basic aspects of um, learning. Okay? But of course, if they're never applicable anywhere, then that would be problematic. Okay? But um, so we'll come back to that, come back to that. Um, so the hot stove effect. Okay? So I'll start with this question. Why do most people disapprove of me? Okay. So, um, so you might think um, this, uh, this fact that people disapprove of me um, indicates that I'm, I'm pretty bad. Okay. But things may not be as bad as they seem. Okay. Um, because um, maybe my impression I give people is somewhat negative to some people, but sometimes it's positive. Okay. So suppose it's 50 50. Okay. So that means I'm not that bad, okay? Um, although a little bit varying, okay? But um, the people who like me, they um, want to meet me again, okay? If they have any choice, okay? We'll come back to that, you know? Sometimes there's no choice and that's interesting. But then the people who don't like me, maybe um, they don't want to meet me, okay? And, and the crucial thing here is that if you meet me again, some people may get a negative impression because you know they thought that oh yeah this guy seems interesting but they meet him again and they say you know this is not so interesting okay but the people who are negative they avoid me okay so their negative impression remains now so overall this means that more than 50 percent have a negative impression okay and, and this is sort of a stable situation. Of course, there's a lot of variations on this. They don't always uh, meet someone they want to meet. They, they're forced to meet people they don't want to meet, <laughs> etc. But this is um, one of the main ideas. So what's interesting here? Um, so what I call adaptive sampling, it just means that whether you sample or, not, or choose to choose an alternative depends on, on on your experience, okay? that's pretty obvious to some extent. But that means that there's this sort of sampling bias in, in our experiences, because the experiences um, we get, we oversample the things that we, we like, okay? and we stop sampling, or at least sample less of the things that we dislike. And that can have systematic consequences. Okay? So um, to some extent, this is sort of uh, almost trivial, okay? <laughs> but it turns out that in psychology, they hadn't thought about this as much. Although, interesting, you know, of course, there's a long literature on learning, okay? Um, so um, I came to this uh, from a different literature, which is um, very much influenced by Jim March, okay? Which, by the way, you see over here <laughs> in a photo, okay? And um, he was... Um, interesting in basic aspects about learning. Okay? And this kind of, uh, the exploration expectation trade-off was very central in that con conception of learning. Whereas in, uh, I guess in psychology, again, I said, I will not really a psychologist, but there was a lot of emphasis on just learning with stimuli that just provided it to you. And this sort of choice, whether the stimuli is provided or not, wasn't uh, salient, but that was very, very salient in other um, conceptions of, of learning. Um, Okay, uh, so yes, there's a lot of focus on uh, this, this part in psychology. So the information you have available and then what's your impression, okay? And then lots and lots and lots of 
Um, and some people actually define this as psychology. I think somebody once said to me, you're not a psychology because psychology is all about how people's head mess things up, okay? Uh, so, okay, I'm not a psychologist, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so a lot of psychology is focused on this, uh, but this aspect is very important. Now, of course, if, if you, there's a lot of work on this loop also. And actually in stereotyping and so on, there's some always been interest in this, okay? So the hot stove effect, um, so that was um, defined then and written in this paper with um, uh, Jim. Um, so if you don't know Jim March, he was a professor of um, business, but he was actually a full professor of political science, sociology, education, and business at Stanford, okay? Anyway, so we wrote this paper and then we call it the hot stove effect. And that's from this quote by Mark Twain, okay? Um, so it's like the cat that sits down a hot stove, okay? She will never sit down on a hot stove again, and that's well, but she will never sit down on a cold one, okay? Um, so the, the, the cat avoids the stove and then can't um, change uh, his or her impression or, or don't get any more fine-grained information about it, okay? By the way, if you look at this quote and think about it, it's actually sort of a failure of generalization because there is an aspect of the hot stove, of the stove, um, which is fine. You can sit on the stove if it's not hot, okay? So if the cat could have sort of learned some signs of that, um, um, it could have been better off. So um, we drew this sort of conclusion that alternatives that are poorly are likely to be avoided. Um, so that's a truism, okay? But it implies that it's less likely we get additional information about alternatives that do poorly because we avoid them, okay? And the result is that we will often fail to correct errors evolving alternatives that initially appear worse than they actually are, okay? So um, I have uh, spent considerable time <laughs> examining this uh, from um, theoretical and partly empirical aspects also, but mainly theoretical. And as we'll see, this uh, I believe is a um, fundamental problem in learning and um, we can't get around it, okay? Um, even if people are completely rational, um, you can't get around this issue, okay? So that, well, that's what we call the hot stove effect, okay? And that leads to the asymmetric error correction, okay? So what's that? So if your impression is low and perhaps too low, but you don't know that, okay? Then you're likely to sample again. So you're likely to correct that error, okay? Okay, but what about if, if your impression is high? Well, but if it's high and that means positive, okay? Then you're likely to sample again, okay? Or so, yeah, so you're likely to sample again and then you're likely to correct that error, okay? So we get this asymmetry that errors of underestimation are more likely and errors of overestimation, which sounds paradoxical, but um, yeah, it follows directly. And if you take most learning models, you simulate it and look at this, you, you get this asymmetry immediately, okay? You need, um, not if you have one period, of course, you need to have some update thinking. So you can demonstrate this. Um, so this is an interesting, <laughs> acute asymmetry, um, uh, but does it matter, okay? Yes, to some extent. Um, I, I just want to stress, though, that um, the hot stove effect is not a hypothesis about human behavior, okay? It's a um, statistical phenomena like regression to the mean, okay? So regression to the mean can provide inspiration for a lot of ideas, in, um, also in psychology, okay? For example, um, error, Ido has this uh, great paper from 94 about errors and, and basically about regression to the mean, okay? And we can, we can explain things uh, um, using this idea of regression to the mean that we thought needed much more complicated explanations, okay? So that's how I view the hot stove effect, okay? Um, so we need to separate the sort of, the sort of statistical aspect of it from, from any application to, to well, to, to any domain, including psychology, okay? However, okay, um, 
you know, past impressions do in, uh, change whether we sample something or choose something. So then it does have um, some, some interesting implications. Okay. Um, but again, I want, uh, yeah. So, um, so, so most of my own work okay, has been about sort of general um, implications of this asymmetry, okay? uh, rather than the detailed work on uh, how people actually behave. Okay? Um, I, I know about that and I have some <laughs> uh, things to say about it, but, but, but um, I'm not the, the, the best source to, to discuss that. Okay? We'll come back to that. Okay? So let me illustrate an early illustration, which I think is really great. Okay, um, um, and and um, they didn't refer to to, to this uh, hot stove effect, but they basically did this experiment that that really nicely demonstrated it. So it's a survival game. You have to eat beans to survive. Okay, and if you don't eat enough beans, then you die. Blah blah blah. Okay, so you have to figure out which are the good beans. Okay, so they vary a lot. These beans. So are the beans, um, you know, do, do you need a lot of dots? And, and what about the shape and so on, okay? So you need to eat the bean, okay? Eat the bean. If you eat the bean, you get the energy, okay? But some beans have uh, negative energy. Okay, so it's like a learning task, um, classification task, but with this element that you only get to see the, the uh, energy of the beans that you decide to eat, okay? But they vary that also to see if that mattered, okay? So what happens then, okay? Um, so you can make two types of errors. You can believe a positive bean is negative, okay? So you believe, oh, you know, it's actually a good bean, but you believe it's bad, okay? So that's an error of underestimation, okay? So um, after, when you play this game, they presented you with some beans and said, um, what do you think about this bean? Is this a good or bad bean, okay? And, and then you have to guess, okay? And, and then there's some probability of error, okay? So this was the probability of, um, uh, of an error. Well, you know, um, that doesn't say anything in itself, okay? But let's compare it to the other error, okay? So that's the error of overestimation, that you believe a negative bean is positive, okay? So that was much less, okay? And why? Well, because if we go back to these ones, when did they happen? If you believe it's a bad bean, you avoid it and you don't correct the mistake, okay? If you believe it's a good bean, you try it and then you can find out. Okay, so then you say, well, this is sort of an asymmetry. Lots of other things could explain that, okay? And that's right in general. And um, you know, sometimes the hot stove effect just implies a negativity bias, which a lot of other theories could explain. Um, but in almost everything I talk about here, um, you, can, you can check that, okay? Because you can, uh, for example, what they did here is that they um, provided information about the energy level of beans, even for the beans that you did not decide to eat, okay? So, so they had one version where you only got information about beans that you decided to eat. <laughs> and then one version you got it where even when, when um, you, you didn't decide to eat them and there was no asymmetry. If, if you got information in, even if you didn't decide, to, uh, even if you did not eat them, okay, you decide to eat them. So it was clearly this kind of approach avoid um, behavior that generated this asymmetry. So then um, um, we and, and some others have talked about a lot of phenomena that this implies, okay? So I'm gonna mention some of them, but I actually want to discuss a lot the sort of normative implications, okay? And also I wanna to come to, to uh, some ideas about generalization, which I think are, are interesting, uh, which we're currently working on. And also the implications um, of this for, for algorithms, okay? Um, which, is, which is quite interesting, okay? So um, here's some example of behavior others have explained <laughs> with the hot stove effect, okay? Um, so first, um, risk taking. Now, um, there is, of course, a, a large literature on decisions from experience, and 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 I believe that um, uh, if you have attended uh, some other seminars in in this series, you you heard a lot about that. Okay, and of course, Ido is a leader in that, and and there they have illustrated how the hot stove effect can can lead to risk aversion. Okay, um, so I just explained the basic idea, and then I'm going to mention some some other 
uh, research about animals, which I find interesting. Okay. okay, so learners can learn to avoid risky alternatives as a result of the hot stove effect. So how does that work? Well, if you have a risky alternative, you can get a high outcome or a low outcome. But if you get a high outcome, you can try it again. Okay. If you get a very low outcome, you may say, hey, this is a bad alternative, so you may avoid it. Okay. So is this asymmetry again? And, and why risk aversion then? Well, first, if you compare to like a completely safe alternative, okay? But then also, if you have, if it's a more variable alternative, you get, can get more extreme outcomes, okay? And if you're more likely to avoid alternative, if you get the really bad outcome, then you get this sort of seemingly risk aversion, even if you actually were risk neutral. So if, if there's less variability, the, it's less likely you get the very low outcome. And then it doesn't lead to as, as much avoidance. Of course, this depends on some assumptions here. Yeah, so this, um, like I said, there's a lot of work on, on decision from experience with, with humans, okay? And, and I think you know that they've compared lots of scenarios where you sample or you get um, uh, information about all the alternatives or only the alternatives that you choose. And that, that there's a, a increased, tendency to avoid risky alternatives if you only get information about the alternatives um, that you choose. That is, you don't get the foregone payoff. Um, but there's an interesting experiment also, I don't know uh, if you heard about this. Um, so it turned out this Marcus Feldman uh, has written several papers about the hot stove effect, okay? Um, and then uh, including this one, um, Marcus Feldman is a famous um, theoretical biologist at uh, Stanford. So they did an experiment with birds, okay? and at the end of it, they basically show, and, and the whole uh, paper was motivated by the hot stove effect. So they showed um, that um, they learned to avoid risky alternative. Okay? <laughs> it, it's actually set up is somewhat similar to, to the um, decisions from experience. Okay? So you get a safe alternative or uh, you get lots of seed only 10% of the time. Okay? So what they looked at is they looked at the, the sequence um, and they showed that the avoidance of the risky alternative emerged as a result of them uh, not getting <laughs> any seed when they tried it, okay? And then they're avoiding it and they could see that in, in, in some detail. And here's another, um, to my surprise, there's actually some um, economist or financial economist who took up uh, this idea, okay? Um, and they have examined uh, in some detail. So this is a nice paper. So this is about managers who um, uh, take risks of some kind and then uh, get negative experiences. Okay. Um, so they look at that. So, so how do they? What do they do then? Well, they look at these uh, executives. Do they take? Uh, and then there are different financial decisions, and they can be more or less risky. And then they look at the experiences they've had. Okay. Um, and they're explicitly testing this uh, hot stove effect. Um, and of course, it's difficult in this non-experimental setting to, to determine causality, but they do the typical kind of econometrics thing. They look at uh, sort of almost random events, like you know, if, if you die and things like that, <laughs> and what happens then. So, so they claim um, that there is this, that what they observe is consistent okay, with this. So that's an interesting. And, and one of the neatest is um, about trust, okay? So in this 2005 paper, I didn't mention about trust and, and these guys um, tested this, okay? And, and I think this is a nice study. So you know a trust game. So a trust game, I give you money, okay? Now um, it gets multiplied to 30. You can keep all of it or you can give 15 back, okay? So, um, well, you know, why don't you keep all of it? It's not repeated or anything, okay? But people tend to give back, okay? Um, so, um, so what they had observed though, is, so this is a, apparently a, a st um, stylized fact, is that people underestimate how trustworthy others are, okay? In this game, okay? So they believe people are not that trustworthy. That is, uh, because if you don't trust the other guy, you shouldn't give any money, okay? <laughs> Um, but actually, it's a good thing to give money because most people are trustworthy in this game, okay? So they wonder why that was the case, okay? And then they thought that um, basically avoidance, okay, can, can be one reason, okay? And, and here's, um, so basically they thought the following. 
that if you believe it's trustworthy, you hand over the money, you get nothing back, and the false belief can be corrected. But if you believe he's not trustworthy, you don't hand over any money, you can't observe, and the false belief not corrected. Okay? So they examine that by, uh, but by again, looking at um, learning in a setting where, where you have to learn about trust and with or without uh, information about foregone um, payoffs. That is, um, they examine what would happen if people did get the information about if someone that they didn't trust <laughs> would have trusted them, okay, uh, would have been trustworthy. So you have to make decisions. Oh, should I give back uh, the money? Okay, and you have to make, the other person has to make the decision whether to trust. Uh, and they can tell them, oh, you didn't hand over any money, but if you had, uh, you know, that person would have given you money back, okay? So they show there was a big difference there. So it doesn't, it doesn't show that it's driving everything. It, it shows that it explains half of it, half of the bias, observed bias. Jerka? Yes? Uh, quick question. So, so you said this game was not repeated. So what is there to learn from? I'm, I'm not sure. Ah, I'm yeah. So it, um, it's not repeated with the same person, but it's repeated with a population. Okay. okay. So it's not repeated with the same person because otherwise it's a repeated game. And then, you know, uh, yeah. So when people do this, um, you know, it's a typical kind of population, students and so on. So, so actually, most of the time you can trust people. So if you give them money, you get money back. Okay. So, so it's a good idea. But most people don't really believe that. Okay. Or, or they believe 50 50, and the truth is 80%. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if people are forced to trust others, <laughs> they become less cynical. Okay. Um, so in real life, you only find out if you trust someone. Okay. But in the experiment, they tried this. And then people started to trust others um, uh, quite a lot more. Okay. So that was. By the way, in, in, uh, there's an interesting extension of this, which is the following, that even um, if you don't trust someone, you may still transact with them, but you may implement um, incentives okay, in such a way, or contracts in such a way that if the other party um, tries to cheat, it's very costly. Okay? So as a result, the other party doesn't cheat. Okay? But then you don't know if those incentives and contracts would have been necessary, okay? And then you can't interpret the behavior, okay, um, um, in, in the same way, because basically the, you may structure the situation in such a way that it would be extremely costly for the other person to, to um, um, so that's another, and that's a little bit more sophisticated. You're changing the setting in such a way that the information you get, you get the information, but that information can't, doesn't allow you to infer uh, something about the trait of this individual. Okay, so I want to ask a little bit, when and why does it does this occur, okay? Um, and it, of course, it doesn't always occur. So I want to say uh, a few things. It's not super technical, okay? But, but, and I guess these are just illustrations, okay? Um, so let's think about the extremely simple setup. In period one, you observe a payoff, okay? And it's drawn from this distribution with, with uh, expected value u. Now in period two, you may observe another payoff, okay? So you sample this alternative and you sample it with this probability, okay? So what this, this is a function, this h, x, y, that's a function of the first period's payoff, okay? Now, um, let's just look at the average of both the payoffs, okay? Um, now, if you don't sample in period two, you only have the first one. So then the average is just the first period payoff, okay? But, um, okay. So um, the theorem is that the expected value of this average, okay, is less than u whenever this is a strictly increasing function. So, so why is that, okay? Well, that's when exactly when you tend to sample something, that you believe is good, okay? And you avoid sampling something. So um, let's try to understand why this occurs, okay? So clearly, if the initial payoff are low, and, and this is an increasing function, that is, you, you're less likely to sample than if, if x1 is low, okay? Okay, and then 
you don't get any form of information, so your belief stays low, okay? That's fine. If the initial payoff is high, okay? Well, but then you're likely to sample, okay? But then you get another payoff, okay? Okay, so this, I mean, we haven't completely explained it now because now we're saying, yeah, you know, there's a low payoff and, and sometimes you only have that one, but sometimes you have a high payoff, okay? So how come we get this bias overall, okay? So let's explain that a little bit more. Um, so imagine the payoffs can only be plus one or minus one, okay? Okay, and suppose you get minus one and suppose you don't take another sample then, okay? So then the only payoff you have is minus one, fine. Now, alternative, you get plus one. And suppose you do take another sample. So, so you get, you are, now you have two payoffs, okay? Now the average is one, what you got first, plus the new payoff, okay? And suppose we take the average of that, okay? As our belief or, or something. Now, what's the expected value? Well, the expected, this is one, we know that, okay? The expected value of this is, is the expected value. We see, assumed to be um, U, okay? And suppose that's zero to make it simple here, okay? Then it goes away. So it's at half, okay? Now, of course, if you have minus one here and a half, okay? And, and these are equally likely, then of course we get the negativity bias because, you know, uh, and if you compute that, obviously we get that. But, but what's the true, uh, what's the deep explanation here? The explanation is really the following, okay? You see here, if we have minus one, that gets the full weight, okay? That's our belief now. But if we have plus one, we get another observation, okay? And each of the observations, if we take the average, um, this should be equal here, by the way. So. <laughs> if we take the average, okay? Each observation gets weighted um, a half, okay? So a high payoff, will be likely combined with another payoff, okay? And if we take the average, the high payoff will be diluted, okay? Now, of course, we don't necessarily take the average. We may have some much more complicated belief of formation rule, okay? But, but think about it. If you, there's some weight of the new observation, okay? That, then we'll basically get the same thing, okay? That the, the, the old observation, if it's positive, will be a bit diluted, okay? Um, so that's why, why it occurs, okay? And having said that, um, we can actually uh, generalize it. So recently um, I demonstrated this, that you know, this, doesn't, this doesn't require that we stop sampling, okay? So here in this setup, either you sample or you don't, okay? And if you sample, you take one sample, okay? Um, but actually we don't need that. So suppose um, in period one, you, take, you get K payoffs, okay? But in period two, you do take samples, okay? And always more than zero, okay? But the number of samples you take depend on, the, um, uh, on your initial belief, okay? So imagine you have to select like uh, PhD students from different places, okay? So you believe, oh, place A is much better, okay? But then they decided to go somewhere else and so on. So, so then you still have to take some from, from place yeah, uh, B, okay? But, but maybe you try to take as many you can from place A, but you get some from place B, okay, still. So you sample from place B, even though you think it's not as, not as good, but your sample size is not as large, okay? And then we get the same. We get the same, okay? So when this number of samples you take uh, depends on, on your belief on that, okay? In a positive way, so you take more samples if you believe it's good then we get this negativity bias. And you know, we always get the opposite if you have the other dependence. So why is this? Because high payoffs <laughs> will be combined with lots of others, okay? Because if you sample more, if you believe something is good, we get more payoffs, okay? And yeah. So we have this dilution uh, factor. So that's the sort of deep reason why we get this phenomenon. Um, I should say, of course, we don't always get it, okay? And, and this is some of the most crucial assumptions, and we can discuss that later. Um, so we need that 
your impression of an alternative impact the probability you approach or avoid it. And that may not be true. Why? Because you're not, um, you can't choose, okay? Um, for, for lots of reasons, okay? Impression needs to change with new experiences because otherwise, um, otherwise, if, if, if your impression remains the one you had in your first encounter, and the first, then that first encounter is sort of unbiased, okay? And then you would keep that um, unbiased, okay? And, and of course, you know, impressions do change, but maybe they don't change that much, and there can be all kinds of issues with that. And we also need that if an alternative is avoided, no new information is provided by it, okay? About it. That's this uh, foregone payoff or not. But on that, okay? Uh, so, so overall here, there are lots of reasons why this might fail, okay? And I do in all kinds of situations, okay? <laughs> um, but sometimes it occurs, even though, um, even though one might, sometimes we get a host of effect, even though one might not have expected it, okay? <laughs> For interesting reasons, okay? Because even information is available, it may not be attended to or processed. So there's work, actually, some of them are colleagues at work, who've shown that if you, uh, investments in the stock market is very much driven by what you, happens early on, okay? Because of avoidance and so on. Um, but, but there, of course, you can always find out uh, the sort of foregone uh, uh, value of investment, okay? Because you can just look in the financial pages, okay? So, so but um, still, this sort of personal experience is, is, is uh, really important. And then some work um, recently also showed that um, descriptions case, you know, if people are, you know this literature, but if people are described alternatives, I mean, they act as if they don't completely believe it, and then it impacts how they um, learn from experience and so on. And then they show that descriptions can induce this kind of hot soul effect, a version of it, okay? But people avoid alternative, um, but if they had experience, they would have come less risky worse. Something that's interesting I, I've been thinking about and, and which occurs in the instance-based learning theory, if you're familiar with that, it's basically that alternatives that you sort of initially don't think are very good, they're not really considered, okay? You don't pay much attention to them. And if you don't pay much attention to them, they're not updated as much, okay? Um, so that's an interesting, uh, but, but it makes sense, okay? We can't consider all possible alternatives as, as, uh, as possible hypotheses, okay? Because, so if you initially think, oh, that's not doesn't seem promising, okay? Um, so this this could be a situation where actually, um, if you just attended to alternative, you would be able to understand everything about it, okay? But it's just sort of perhaps too costly even to do that, okay? Good. So I want to move on to to some of the normative effects, okay? And um, so here's a great study about recommendation algorithms, uh, and that's from my former PhD student, now professor in uh, Gaia Le Mans, okay? Le Mans. And um, so they show that basically the hot stove effect implies um, a bias in online ratings, okay? So they took the hot stove effect to, to a collective level, okay? So, um, so here's how it works. Okay? So there's some rating, okay? You decide uh, whether to buy an item and, and rating, okay? And then if you're gonna rate it, okay? And if you don't buy it, um, I mean, presumably you don't rate it then, okay? So then the rating remains, okay? So here there's a collect, that could be a hot stove effect um, at the collective level, okay? Not, a, not within an individual, okay? Uh, but between individuals or within this online rating, okay? So if you have an individual chooses this item, um, buys it, and then doesn't like it, gives a poor rating, the rating now is poor, okay? And then other people um, are less likely to buy it. And as a result, they don't, uh, you don't get an update of the, the rating, okay? So, um, so they did this kind of study. You look at these photos, okay? <laughs> so so uh, Gail is the photographer, okay? So you have to write these photos, okay? Um, and then you have to select which artists to rate, okay? Um, so now they sort of exploited the fact that you tend to select um, the artists that are, that are high up, okay? You don't scroll down enormously to, to, sometimes people scroll down to the end, okay? But they tend to select these artists, okay? 
So, um, so in some conditions, they put the artists um, that were most highly rated at the top, okay? Like, like in many, and, and, and they also told people about this. Um, <clears throat> but in some conditions, they actually took the, to, uh, took the artists that were rated most poorly and took, put them at the top, okay? Okay, so what happened then? So basically, it got this negativity bias. Um, if the items with high ratings were shown at the top of the page, okay? So basically, what happens then is that um, if you have, if you get a high rating, okay, then you show at the top, okay, people look at that, okay, um, and then they can buy those things. But if they have a low rating, okay, they're sh not displayed very prominently. So as a result, um, you're likely, uh, that rating is likely to stick, okay? And that's why we get this, this negativity bias. So, because here the loop is um, uh, a poor rating, then you get displayed less prominently, okay? And, and as a result, it's less likely that others will um, um, sample buy this product or, or uh, rate these photograph photographs, okay? So basically, and they could see exactly this happening in that sequence and so on, okay? But they could also change it, okay? Yeah, so um, that's just what I explained. Th they could have um, the low rating shown at the top, okay? And, and now uh, we get the opposite dynamic, okay? Because if you rate it highly, okay? Now you're gonna be displayed uh, less prominently, okay? But if you rate it poorly, you're gonna be displayed prominently. And because people tend to pick uh, the stuff on, on the top, okay? Um, uh, there was more tendency and, and I show that there was a higher tendency to sample the ones um, at the top of the page. And if they're the low ratings at the top of the page, okay, then they sample them, okay. Um, and, and then it means that if you believe something, so if someone had rated something poorly, now it's displayed at the top. So other people will come uh, and look at it, okay. And then because, you know, it's unlikely, perhaps it wasn't that bad, okay. So, so then it, it, it will go up, okay. Um, so then we get opposite, negative uh, and optimistic bias, okay. Good, yeah, that's just. Okay, so let's come to this now. So will superior algorithms um, eliminate this hot stove effect, okay? Um, so let me make this um, step by step, okay? So, so let's consider this problem. Um, we have 10 periods, you choose whether to sample uncertain alternative or avoid it, okay? Now the outcome of the uncertain alternative is plus one with probability Q and minus one otherwise. If you avoid it, you get zero, okay? Okay, so that's the choice. You don't know Q, okay? Let's say first that you calculate the average, okay? Um, and suppose the probability sampling depends on the average. So if, if you believe the average, um, well, the average proportion of successes, okay? So that's by plus one, okay? So if you have an average above 0.5, then the probability of sampling is 0.8, okay? So this is just an illustration. What happens then? Okay, so you're with me. You just compute this average. What's the proportion of plus ones, okay? And your sampling depends on that. Okay, now this success probability uh, is drawn from a uniform distribution, okay? So um, the average is, 0.5 and they're 50% below 0.5 and 50% above 0.5. So 50% of the case, um, the uncertain alternative is better than the um, than the safe one, okay? Because it's expected value is above 0.5 or above zero. So this is what happens, okay? Um, most learners believe that the uncertain alternative has a low success probability. So this is the estimate at the end of period 10. That's just the average um, it's just the average of the portion of times we have seen uh, the plus one, okay? O of, of the, in the, in, in the, when we chose the uncertain alternative, okay? Okay, um, fine, okay? And, and as I said, um, we can show this. And actually we cannot just show this about the expected value. We can show this whole thing about the probability being below and so on, okay? 
So, so um, probability that you believe it's bigger than that is less than 0.5 and well. Um, anyway, okay, but then you say, this learning rule is not very smart, okay? Because if I happen to observe, if I try it once, okay? <laughs> and I, I, I observe a failure, okay? Then this rule means that I'm never gonna try it again, or I'm gonna try it with a really low probability, okay? Point two, okay? So isn't this belief rule pretty stupid, okay? If, if I just observe one failure, I shouldn't estimate the success probability to be zero, okay? So <clears throat> I should take sample size into account, okay? Okay, so let's do that. So let's be Bayesian, okay? So now we do the same thing, but we're Bayesian, okay? So what does it mean? It means that we have a prior, okay? And the prior is this uniform that we're drawing it from. And then we update the success probability based on, on the successes, but the sampling is exactly the same as before, okay? So, so now we have a Bayesian learner, um, but sampling works the same as before. What happens? Well, basically the same thing, okay? 52% um, below and 41% um, above. Now they don't add up to 100 because sometimes you're exactly at 0.5, okay? So we still get this negativity bias, okay? Um, okay. Um, but there's one more thing that we need to think about, okay? Is it sensible to avoid the uncertain alternative to one failure, okay? So uh, actually these two rules, the learning rules weren't so different, okay? In one case, if you got a failure, you estimated the, the success proportion to be zero, which is perhaps stupid, but you avoided it. I mean, or you sample it in probability point two, but the Bayesian rule is sort of similar, okay? I mean, actually after one failure, your estimate would be 0.33, but you still sort of only sample it with 20%, okay? So maybe, isn't this behavior myopic? Shouldn't the learner explore, okay? The uncertain alternative. Um, yes, because, you know, if you just observe one failure, okay? Um, even if you're, even if you believe now that the success probability is below 0.5, shouldn't you take one more sample to check, okay? And, and of course, um, that's a smart thing to do. And recommendation algorithms um, actually sometimes do this. But the hot stove effect occurs nevertheless, okay? So we have the same setup, okay? We have the Bayesian learner. But the sampling now is the sampling plan that is optimal, okay? That maximizes the total expected outcome. And in that sense, optimally trades off exploration exploitation, okay? Um, I mean, at some point you need to avoid, I mean, if you observe, if you observe failure, 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 failure in nine periods, and now it's the 10th, okay? And you only have 10 periods. I mean, it's not a very smart thing to, oh, I should explore once more. No, I mean, <laughs> at some point you have to exploit, okay? So we have to find at what point should you exploit, okay? And, and so you can compute this numerically by backwards induction. Um, so what's the result? This is the result. Underestimation. <laughs> most of the time, actually almost stronger, a stronger effect, okay? So even if, and this is an optimal algorithm, okay? Optimal in what sense? Um, it maximizes the expected total uh, payoff during these 10 periods, okay? So if you're gonna get rid of this bias, um, we have to re reduce our expected payoff, okay? So this is how it works over time, okay? Initially, it chooses the uncertain alternative, but then it drops down, okay? And we end up below 50%, okay? Which you can prove that this will occur. Um, so we end up being risk averse, even if we are Bayesian and we have this optimal algorithm, okay? So if we improve our algorithms more and more, um, we will nevertheless have this bias, but maybe we shouldn't call it bias then if it's the result of, um, how can we understand um, why this occurs? So there are two types of errors, overestimation and underestimation. 
in, in this problem I've talked about now, there's an opportunity cost involved only in testing errors of underestimation. Why? Because if you believe um, something is great, okay, you don't know, of course, if, if, if it's an error of overestimation or underestimation, but if you believe an alternative is great, okay, you want to choose it um, because you believe it's good, and you may want to choose it because you want to explore it, okay? But if you believe an alternative is bad, the only reason why you choose it is because of exploration, okay? So there is this bias built in, okay? Um, it's costly <laughs> to test these errors of uh, possible underestimation, I should say, okay? If you believe an alternative is bad, yeah, you should try it, you know, to make sure maybe it could be good, but there's a limit to that, okay? And, and, uh, but there's no limit to, uh, yeah. So in a sense, the, the, the original intuition holds very strongly, okay? <laughs> that there is this asymmetry, even in, in the optimal strategy. Good. So I want to end with... Um, I, I will be yes. happy you can wrap up in a minute or two, so we have time for questions. Yes. Okay, Probably. sure. Um, yeah, depending on how you want to do it. Um, I, can, I can wrap up now. And, and then in the, I can talk about these generalization things at, um, at the end. Um, yeah. yeah, if it's fine with you, I think it will be a good idea. Oh, okay, Let, let's do that now. So, okay, let me uh, say something then at the end. Here we are. So, um, yeah. So this has important normative consequences and uh, we can discuss that. I mean, what, what can we really do about this? Okay? Because it has interesting implications and, and problematic implications for evaluation of, of people, okay? Um, So most people disapprove of me, okay? So I just wanna leave you with, with this. Um, but the moral of the story is um, that the people who approve of me are more likely to be correct than the people who disapprove of me, okay? So, so that is at least um, um, uh, a good thing. <laughs> good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now we open uh, the floor for questions. So this is the time. I'm gonna be the first if him or someone is in the list. No, you can be the first, the floor is yours. So Jörger, that was uh, really interesting. And I like your uh, distinction between the psychological effect and the, and the statistical effect. So I guess one way to think about the psychological effect is uh, how people deal with, uh, with this, uh, this fact, this statistical fact. So obviously to do well in life, we should, uh, we should be able to reduce this risk. And, and I think the empirical results suggest that some situations, people are really uh, sensitive to the hot stove effect and uh, exhibit the hot stove effect. Like for example, with taste aversion is extreme example of hot stove effect. But in other situation, people exhibit it less. So maybe this can shed life of what are the processes in which the people end up, uh, natural cognitive processes deal with that. We, what we do we know about uh, the way the people tend to deal with this fact? Oh yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> and there are lots of interesting aspects of that question. So for example, I mean, you and, and Ori have shown that people don't just react in a sort of simplistic way uh, to like the most recent payoff, but I think about the patterns, okay? So that implies that um, you don't necessarily avoid something just because the most recent outcome was bad. Maybe you're thinking about the sequences, okay? And then you can start avoiding it in some other period, which may appear a little bit strange to, to outside observers, okay? Um, so, so yeah, so those issues are, are very interesting, okay? Um, I, I mean, so, so that's, um, but, but there's also another aspect of it, which is that in some contexts, okay, um, there is not much avoidance, okay? 
Um, and then that's not so clear. Okay? I remember early on, I tried to fit a bunch of these models because I thought it was cool because I had like, like sort of, um, I had like analytical solutions to some of these things. Okay? And then I thought I would fit that to this sort of competition data and so on. But um, they didn't work very well. Okay. And um, the reason I realized is because there isn't not much avoidance, okay? Now, maybe this kind of um, uh, idea about the, the sequences and so on uh, can help explain that, okay? But um, uh, I think there are two reasons why there is not much avoidance, okay? So one is, um, well, three perhaps, okay? So the, the first one is sometimes in these games, people are just playing along, okay? And, and, and uh, they find it a little bit boring and so on. So there's sort of a possible artifact or, or the setting and, and whatever, okay? Um, which is maybe less interesting, okay? Um, the other one um, is uh, due to variety of psychological processes, people are not reacting to this st bad stuff as, as much as they, you, you would think they do, okay? And understanding that um, is an interesting issue, okay? when they do that, and you mentioned the aversion and so on. But, but then I think there's an um, alternative, which is uh, a rational explanation, which is that um, I think in some settings, people um, are smarter than our models, okay? And start to realize that, oh, <laughs> things are alternating in a certain way, okay? And then they think about it in, in, in a different way. So, um, yeah. I don't know where it leaves us, though. I'm a little bit um, need to explore different kind of stimuli, perhaps, and 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 see how people um, react in, in those cases. We know that the um, Gale knows more about this, but we know that the reactions um, are stronger if you have continuous stimuli. So Gale um, has done a lot of. I didn't talk about some of his work, but he's done a lot of experiments where people um, um, and um, if you have basically bandit type of settings, okay? And if you have continuous distributions, there's much stronger um, reactions, okay? It's maybe because people in, in, in binary things are looking for patterns and, and, and formulate all kinds of ideas about it that they may or may not do, okay? I see. But, but, so. but our models of it may be very simplistic also, like just sort of see something, <laughs> change your belief about that in an extremely simple way, so, yeah. Okay, so you convinced me that, so this is really a really interesting open question to try to understand the magnitude of, uh, of this effect in different settings. Yeah. So there are really many open questions there. Thanks. Yeah. Konstantinos, uh, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a fascinating talk. I did not know about the hot stove effect. And I, I think it's really eye-opening in, in many ways. And while you were talking, especially in regards to the trust uh, experiments, I was thinking of the, of the saying, trick me once, shame on uh, you, trick me twice, shame on me. <laughs> and I was thinking that it, it might be related to, to this kind of uh, avoidance that we have towards risk uh, evolutionarily when uh, it's more risky to, to have a miss uh, than uh, having a, miss a false alarm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if error management theory might have something to, to add to, to your models and uh, your explanations. And if you could actually control the frame of the experiment and frame it as, as a potential gain or as a potential uh, loss and see if there's a, the, the asymmetry reverses. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's very interesting, yeah. So they have, uh, I don't really know what error management here is, but um, this kind of different framing, yes. Um, that's quite important, okay? So um, to, to get, um, if you frame it as a search for um, just uh, potentially good stuff, okay? Then they don't react so much to, to bad events, okay? But if you make them very sensitive to um, losses, yeah, then, then you get more avoidance, okay? So, so that's an interesting thing. I mean, it, it should, it's sensible also. If you expect, um, I mean, if you're like a venture capitalist, so you're only looking for really uh, potentially really high payoff things, okay? Then that you get some losses, they don't, that, that doesn't really deter you, okay? Yeah, so, uh, and I guess it depends on the setting and, all, and your expectations about that also. So, yeah, yeah. 
I know. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Um, Amir is asking, how do you reconcile this effect with the context such as people buying lottery tickets despite the fact that most of often they lose money? Yeah, obviously, you know, the, um, the, so, so by, I, well, it'd be interesting to see a study, okay? But, but obviously this doesn't explain everything, okay? And people have all kinds of beliefs, okay? So in that context, I mean, is that the learning setup, okay? When they are mainly learning about the value of, of um, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, so, so here, yeah, it has to be, I mean, it's interesting to think about it. You know, if you buy a lottery ticket, okay, and you don't win, do you change your assessment of whether you will win, okay, or of the lottery, okay? Um, in many cases, you wouldn't, okay? But maybe in some cases, and maybe some people would, okay? So it's interesting relating to the stock market, okay? So the stock market, if you do poorly, then you sort of avoid it, okay? And, uh, but then there is information nevertheless. You could see what you could have gained and so on. But maybe people believe, uh, and maybe they have some justification, or I'm not sure it exists, that, that their own choices, there's something magical about that. So if they were poor about it, then, <laughs> so if they, um, you see what I'm saying? So, and maybe people can believe that about lotteries also. So if you choose, um, Lottery, and if you, if you don't, that shows that you're not good at lotteries, okay? I, I'm, I'm sure there are people who believe that, okay? And, and if we look at those people, um, I think we, we would get this kind of effect, okay? You know, you get it with the, the stock market, even though they, in, in some sense there shouldn't be an effect. Um, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. What are the things that we change our beliefs about, okay? Uh, as a result of our personal experiences. Okay, thank you. As for now, our time, time unfortunately is running uh, up, so we have to end the seminar now. But the good news is that if it's the aircraft fine with you, we will stay for about 10 or 15 more minutes for people who still want to ask questions. And thanks for uh, coming. And good. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to stay. Or you wanted to ask something. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I was wondering what, what you think of uh, how uh, recommendation algorithms, recommendation uh, systems uh, deal with this hostile effect. So, so I have, so, so it's kind of a, a, a two questions. First, empirically or, or theoretically, what you showed is that the optimal strategy in the 10 period case, 66% of the time you should, uh, uh, Right, you should avoid the uh, the gamble, and actually, what we see. So I think what you showed is that empirically, the the, the probability of people avoiding it is 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 lower than sixty six percent. Right? Is that correct? Was it fifty one percent or? Um, I'm not sure. I showed such a you get that kind of comparison, but but anyway, yeah. You think that people avoid more or less or? So so I, I so so I think it was somewhere so. A couple, of, maybe I got it wrong, but a couple of slides. So one of them showed that. Uh, well, I, I, but I just compare different algorithms, like averaging and versus and so on. Okay. Oh, so just comparison of algorithms it wasn't yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. empirical data. Okay. Yeah. So, so do we know if 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 we know that the optimal, the, the Bayesian optimal, uh, is is actually uh, uh, doing more uh, errors of uh, underestimation? Do we know if people actually do it more than they should, or? Well. Um... Then we come back to the way the experiments have been done, okay? okay. Um, but if we, if we go to their experiments on bandit problems, okay? And actually some of them do find that, yes, people explore more than they sort of should, okay? Isn't this a finding in search also? Um, but they search so more than they should. Is that right? So, so if uh, you, if no, wait a second. This is just... Um, um, uh, you don't get to reverse then, you just get um, less of a negativity bias than you would have had otherwise. Okay? So but but, but it's more it... complicated that it depends how you define it then, because people can search more, but still rely a lot on their first impression, okay? which I think is the case. Okay? So then you can actually end up with, even if they do explore more, 
they sort of quite resistant to change their mind uh, because they first got the negative. So yeah, yeah. So that comparison is tricky. Um, okay. but, but, but yes, yes, that's what I'm saying that if algorithms become more rational, okay? <laughs> if people become more rational, we get, get more, we may get more of this bias, okay? Because in yes, fact, so, so are, I, I but, but we have that... to be careful though, because it depends on the setting, okay? So in the setting where really a lot of things are at stake, okay? Do people explore too much or too little? Mm, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what the, the latest research would say, but. Yeah. So, I, but I was thinking of that uh, in terms of what algorithms would do. So if the algorithm is supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, rational, so the, the plan would be uh, a rational, but the algorithm is under something in the dynamic. So, 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 so the algorithm should, should, should somehow solve a dynamic I mean, it is it is completely dynamic. This <laughs> you can't find any algorithm that on my problem does better on than this algorithm. Okay? That, that's for sure. Okay, so and it's completely dynamic. It, it you know you solve the whole problem going back for backwards. Okay, so you think you do have but you do have an ending period. Yes, but you can also not have an ending period to get the same thing. We just have to have discounting of the future. Okay. Okay, so so how do algorithms? Do you know how do these uh, real life algorithms solve this? For example, well, but they have various. System? Yeah, they have basically various um, approximations. You know, so that you can't really sort of solve the expiration expectation problem in in real life settings because uh, it's too difficult to compute and and do Bayesian over everything. So they have all kinds of um, algorithms where, like that approximate it, okay? and and. Almost all of, yeah, all of them end up in the same, okay, yeah, problem, yeah. I do. <laughs> Although I can't swear by that, but yeah, it would be strange if they didn't, yeah. I think there is a literature on this a little bit in uh, some work in, in machine learning and so on, okay. Um, but yeah, but I haven't done so much. I mean, actually some, I know, when I was at MIT visiting, then there was some discussion with some people in marketing there. And they said that some of the companies, they were interested in this case, okay? but they had problems, the companies, because you know you have to display stuff that the consumer said, that the consumer said they didn't like, okay? So, you know, then consumers get pissed at the, the, the people who do the algorithms, okay? So it's not that easy. You know, normatively, it's an issue of who is paying the cost for the expiration. And, and if you think about this as forming beliefs about people's competences, okay, and all kinds of effects and so on, and that can give rise to basically what looks like stereotypes, then again, it's the question of who is paying that cost and, on, and yeah. So if you have a sequence of people each maximizing, okay, uh, then they're not as willing to, to pay the cost, okay. But, but if, so, so that's an information externality, okay, normatively. Uh, going on. So if we solve the problem uh, for all life, <laughs> for the planet, okay, then maybe we would be more willing to uh, explore, okay, to pay the cost. Uh -huh. okay? It's like yeah, each employer is not willing to explore enough with each um, employee to find out if they're really good, okay. So maybe that's why we have schooling and other things to, to you know, things like that. Um, so, so it's like an externality. <laughs> Can yes. add? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, so when you have a bad outcome, let's say impression, so you meet someone and you have a bad experience. It's not only this person. He is related to a group of people. He is related to the place or a country or a, I don't know, he wears some kind of clothes or other things that you can generate. So what are the, how can we model? Uh, Yes, and that's really interesting. That's the stuff I didn't talk about, okay? Okay. You still see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to learn uh, about payoffs and about how to generalize, okay? So you go to this restaurant and it's not, it's good or it's not very good, okay? So maybe it's good and then you say pizzerias are good, okay? But maybe you actually say small chain restaurants are good, okay? Because this is a chain, it's a pizzeria in Oxford, I did there. Okay, or, but then you say, uh, perhaps chain restaurants are not so bad, so I have to reevaluate past cases, okay? Well, but maybe you say Italian restaurants are good, and since French are similar to Italian, French should also be good, but they're not, so perhaps they're not similar. So you're learning simultaneously about these things, okay? 
Um, so that's and and even so even the cat in the hot stove um, it, it was more sophisticated than we have been because you know the cat was thinking about you know the well thinking or but we had the stove and the cold and the hot stove and so on. So so can you learn? Um, you really have to learn how to generalize at the same time. Okay. Um, I mean, there's no learning without learning how to generalize. And we are assuming that you have to have one fixed. So how can we think about it? Well, so that's what we are doing some work on that, okay? Um, and basically, uh, let me get to this very quickly. Suppose you have two, you have three alternative, a known, an A and B, okay? And to, to analyze this extremely simplistically, uh, we're looking at the case where Either the, these probabilities, success probability, are the same, or they're independent. Okay? So if they're the same, then if A is good, uh, you can generalize to B. But if they're independent, you can't generalize. Okay? So you have to learn simultaneously about, um, yeah. And we do that in, in, again, a completely Bayesian game. I mean, we can do this non-Bayesian, but, but it's almost easier to think about it. Okay? And what do we get, okay? If you believe someone is bad, you think they're similar. Okay? <laughs> so, so basically, if you believe, um, if you end up believing that these people are bad, you believe they're similar, okay? But if, if you believe they're good, you believe they're actually quite different, okay? Or more different. So we get this association, okay? And that's basically because, um, well, it's actually, uh, an intri intricate story, what happens, but, but, um, but yeah. So that's a really interesting issue, okay? Um, that about, um, um, and we can get other things also. Actually, I, I should say, um, recently we've done some work and, and um, maybe you've seen, sometimes I presented that. We can actually get the opposite story. Um, and this has been out there and I haven't, so recently I've clarified in my own mind about this when it happens. Suppose you have two alternatives, A and B. Okay, so if you have no generalization, you only update, okay? So, so maybe you underestimate both A and B, okay? Um, okay so, well, so then you would have the hot stove effect for each A and B, okay? okay? You can't, don't generalize at all between them, okay? But let's add generalization. So if you observe A, you update about B and vice versa, okay? And then we can actually get the opposite, okay? Uh, so how does that work? You try B, low payoff, try A, high payoff. But now you avoid B, okay? Because B has low payoff. But you continue to choose A, okay? But suppose you generalize from A to B. But then you will also update about B. And, and if you get high payoff from A, you'll start be becoming more positive about B, okay? And actually, um, this may result in uh, the reversal, okay? You can actually end up being, uh, becoming, overestimating the alternatives. <laughs> um, so we can show that that happens if you have um, an exemplar learning model, okay? Um, so extremely simplistically here, you observe a signal, okay? And then you have a new um, object, okay? You have to estimate the outcome and you do that in this kind of similarity weighted way, it just depends on the distance then, okay? Well, the inverse of distance, I should say. Um, so basically, if you observe a signal here, you say, oh, they are close by, so I estimate something close by, okay, in the outcome. If you do that, um, what happens, okay? So you start out like this, okay? You have some, you explore some objects here, okay? Okay, and then you say, well, these are the ones with high signal that are the good ones, okay? And then you decide, I'm only gonna accept these ones, okay? Okay? So now you keep accepting uh, these ones. You don't accept any, anything uh, here, let's say, okay? Now you're gonna get more and more, okay? Objects here, okay? So it turns out a very large class of exemplar models will then, uh, will continue to generalize, okay? 
And they have a feature, um, which is that, which basically means that the more exemplars you get, um, the more weight you put on those, okay? So the more, so in the end, you're just gonna keep on generalizing from these good stuff. So eventually you may get to the optimal threshold, but that is not stable because you're not, you're hardly getting any signals here, okay? You're getting most of them here and they tend to be pretty good. And as a result, you will actually end up with a threshold uh, below the optimum, okay? So you're being too uh, lenient, okay? And so this happens. Um, you can actually get, unless, unless you decide that this threshold is so low that you don't, uh, that you don't adopt, that you don't sample anything, okay? So, so yeah, there's interesting interactions between these, okay? But then you might say, well, that's because this algorithm is a bit stupid, okay? It should realize that you could, shouldn't generalize, okay? Um, well, okay, uh, should you and shouldn't you? That's why we also want to analyze this case where, 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 where you like learn about the similarity. Okay? Um, but yeah, so it's a bit, how to think about this is not easy, okay? But um, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. So, so that's a really interesting issue, okay? You know that if you learn about the value of an object and you learn about the similarity of an object, uh, between each other at the same time, then all kinds of interesting things happen. Um, in the following sense that, for example, this, this formula, um, that will have to break down, okay? This is based on, you know, Gilbo and, and, and uh, these guys who have this uh, case-based decision theory. They have a discussion about this. It's very interesting, okay? So basically, um, they have basically, a, a theorem it says that <laughs> this kind of representation um, cannot hold uh, or assumes that you don't learn the similarity function at the same time as the sort of values of the objects. Okay. That's sort of a proof for this, <laughs> which is very interesting. So yeah, so this thing that you learn about similarity at the same time as the values is very interesting, okay? Um, but how to think about it without, you know, opening up too many cans of worms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I guess it also depends if you have like different dimensions or something. Yeah, something. yeah. It depends if you are in a different exploratory phases for each dimension, right? Because yeah, if there and is have to think about it. it's very difficult to think about this partly because you know what's the sort of original set of dimensions. I mean, so and yeah, but we can do simple things like you know, um, and, and maybe okay. I'm afraid our time is running uh, out. You already, you also answered the Peter's question about uh, discrimination or prejudice. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see the chat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's been an important issue in my. That's how I started thinking about these issues, by the way. In one, thank you very much. It was very interesting, very interesting talk, um, and uh, we learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So you shouldn't come to my next talk then. What? what? Ah. You shouldn't come to my next talk then. <laughs> no, 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 no. Consider it. We'll come, we'll come. It's maybe we'll not come as interesting. For more. <laughs> if we didn't listen more. And the people who again. didn't like it may come <laughs> to my next talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks very much. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Yeah, I'm interested if anybody has some, you know, thought or insights about this. I'm always interested. So send that along. Okay. Sure. And we also will post your uh, video. So those who have not come will mm -hmm. not have the hot stove effect and will listen to it. On so YouTube. you're going to force them to listen to it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.